He looked curiously at his own hand on the banisters. The stairs were very steep, and it seemed to take him a long time to surmount them. Instead of feeling keenly as he knew he ought to feel, he felt nothing at all. When he opened the door, he saw Helen sitting by the bedside. There were shaded lights on the table, and the room, though it seemed to be full of a great many things, was very tidy. There was a faint and not unpleasant smell of disinfectants. Helen rose and gave up her chair to him in silence. As they passed each other, their eyes met in a peculiar, level glance. He wondered at the extraordinary clearness of his eyes, and at the deep calm and sadness that dwelt in them. He sat down by the bedside, and a moment afterwards heard the door shut gently behind her. He was alone with Rachel. And a faint reflection of the sense of relief that they used to feel when they were left alone possessed him. He looked at her. He expected to find some terrible change in her, but there was none. She looked indeed very thin, and as far as he could see, very tired, but she was the same as she had always been. Moreover, she saw him and knew him. She smiled at him and said, Hello, Terence. The curtain which had been drawn between them for so long vanished immediately. Well, Rachel, he replied in his usual voice, upon which she opened her eyes quite widely and smiled with her familiar smile. He kissed her and took her hand. It's been wretched without you, he said. She looked at him and smiled, but soon a slight look of fatigue or perplexity came into her eyes and she shut them again. But when we're together, we're perfectly happy, he said. He continued to hold her hand. The light being dim, it was impossible to see any change in her face. An immense feeling of peace came over Terence, so that he had no wish to move or to speak, and the terrible torture and unreality of the last days were over, and he had come out now into perfect certainty and peace. His mind began to work naturally again, and with great ease. The longer he sat there, the more profoundly was his conscious of the peace invading every corner of his soul. Once he held his breath and listened acutely, she was still breathing. He went on thinking for some time. They seemed to be thinking together. He seemed to be Rachel as well as himself. And then he listened again. No, she had ceased to breathe. So much the better, this was death. It was nothing. It was to cease to breathe. It was happiness. It was perfect happiness. They had now what they had always wanted to have, the union which was impossible while they lived. Unconscious whether he thought the words or spoke them aloud, he said, No two people have ever been so happy as we have been. No one has ever loved as we have loved. It seemed to him that the complete union and happiness filled the room with the rings eddying more and more widely, and he had no wish in the world left unfulfilled. They possessed what could never be taken from them. He was not conscious that anyone had come into the room, but later, moments later, or hours later perhaps, he felt an arm behind him. The arms were round him. He did not want to have arms round him, and the mysterious whispering voices annoyed him. He laid Rachel's hand, which was now cold, upon the counterpane and rose from his chair and walked across to the window. The windows were uncurtained and showed the moon, a long silver pathway upon the surface of the waves. Why, he said in his ordinary tone of voice, look at the moon, there's a hollow round the moon, we shall have rain tomorrow. The arms, whether they were the arms of a man or of woman, were round him again, they were pushing him gently towards the door. He turned of his own accord and walked steadily in advance of the arms, conscious of a little amusement 
at the strange way in which people behaved merely because someone was dead. He would go if they wished it, but nothing they could do would disturb his happiness. As he saw the passage outside the room and the table with the cups and the plates, it suddenly came over him that here was a world in which he would never see Rachel again. Rachel! Rachel! he shrieked, trying to rush back to her. But they prevented him and pushed him down the passage and into a bedroom far from her room. Downstairs they could hear the thud of his feet on the floor as he struggled to break free, and twice they heard him shout, Rachel! Rachel! Rachel!